What's up, Iron Exotics? Welcome back to another exciting episode. Today, we're with a good friend of mine, Julian. You guys saw him in a previous video, the one where we parasite flushed a few snakes. I'll just put a link down for you, for you guys over here. But today, we're actually going to talk about a very interesting subject and something that I think most of you could actually benefit from. We're going to talk about RI in specifically colubras and heavy bodied snakes, things like retics and berms. We're going to cover a few basic questions of that. If you guys find yourself with more questions, you guys can obviously go check Julian out on V Reptiles on Instagram. I'll link it down in the description. Feel free to send him, send him a DM. He's more than willing to help. All right, guys, let's just jump right into this. So we're going to start now, uh, Julian's quickly grabbing the first snake, we're going to be handling snakes while we um, actually answer some questions, you know, just to make it a bit more interesting for you guys, and I think it might get bit, nah, it's not going to get bit. Alright guys, so this is the Citron Motley Tiger, Possible like, Citron. Post Citron Motley Tiger, alright, so it's a pretty big retic, it's a bit cantankerous, so I'm just going to move his head to Julian, and uh, <laughs> alright, so the first question we have for Julian in regards to RI is what is RI actually? Hang on. Oh, we might have some bite footage. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very concerned Chris Reetick, guys. Um, if it's going to continue hassling us, we might actually just decide to put it away. Yeah, I'm actually going to put it away then. We'll... Alright, we're going to put that snake away quickly and then uh, we're going to come back to these questions. Alright, so we're back again, guys. We put away the retic, it was a bit too concerned Chris for this video. <laughs> And um, the first question we actually have for Julian in regards to RI in uh, colubrids and heavy bodied snakes is what is RI actually? RI is a bacterial infection that normally affects the respiratory system. So that's the lungs, um, trachea, glottis. The glottis is what the snake breathes out of, breathes out of um, and obviously that's how they get oxygen. So it's basically just a really, really bad cold for snakes? Yes. And due to the primitive lung. Um, their primitive lung system, it's actually very, very deadly for them. Yes, um, it's essentially a flu, it's a bacterial infection, now, which is contagious. Now, what are the, what are the, um, what are the common causes for RI in both colubrids and in larger bodied snakes? Larger bodied snakes, like the most notorious species of getting respiratory infection, the Burmese python, is when they endure, when they endure Temperatures that are too cold for their conditions, uh, that's, ra uh, that, that's rapidly introduced to them. So if you have a uh, cold front or something that comes up and that is um, introduced to... to, to, to uh, I'm going to get the berm while I continue answering the question. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with the snake. This is also a bit of a cantankerous snake. So obviously the idea is to make sure I don't get tagged. Yes. It's, it's a very nice snake though. <laughs> <laughs> all right so um we might have to put this one away as well we'll see yeah all right so that. the next question for you is uh how do you identify respiratory infection in snakes um normally the the easiest case scenario is actually listen to the snake uh listen to the breathing pattern and everything uh, normally a gargling sound coming from the mouth um also sometimes tends to be wheezing depends on how severe the case is uh, also, if you open up the mouth, uh, for depending on the species, uh, for example, Burmese pythons, reticular pythons have got quite a pinkish mouth. Now, when they have respiratory infection, the pinkish mouth turns more to a discolored, off-white sort of color. 
um, and you notice a lot of mucus, so uh, spitty, <laughs> uh, a lot of mucus in the mouth spit, um, depending how severe the case can be, they'll actually end up spitting mucus, uh, it's like, it's literally like a gob ball that comes out of the trachea, the glottis. And um, after you've identified it, well, actually, we just covered heavy body snakes now. So how do yeah. you identify in colubrids, though? Colubrids is essentially the same thing. Um, you'll, well, obviously, for larger bodied animals, you can hear it a lot easier. For example, we could hear it from here if the animal were to have respiratory infection. Now, something for colubrids like the corn snake, milk snake, king snake, rat snake, uh, whatever other colubrids you could think of. Um, I'm just mentioning the, the vast majority. Um, there you'll have to actually listen more closely, you could actually put your ear closer to the animal and then you could actually also hear slight wheezing, slight, go slight gargling, but another easy case to notice is although it does put a lot of stress on the animal, you actually open up the animal's mouth and you'll also notice um, colubrids do have a bit more of a white sort of color to their gums, so it's not like the pythons where they've got quite pinkish gums, they've got more of a white sort of coloration to the gums, depending on the species as well. Um, and unfortunately you get a wide variety of colubrid species. Um, you also notice there's mucus in the mouth. Um, I've never ever experienced the case where they actually start spitting out little gob balls out of the trachea, but it's obviously common. Uh, not, not common, it does happen. Um, and then yeah, that's about it for colubrids. So that's how you identify, right? Okay, so after identifying, there's obviously a process of treatment that has to happen. Yes. So what would be the... What's, well, let's, let's ask it like this, right? There's obviously a lot of methods of treating RI, so let's not cover every method, but what is your method of treating respiratory infection in both colubrids and heavy-bodied snakes? Uh, first process of going to treatment is to view the severity of the, of the infection. So if it's a very mild-like case where there's only a little bit of um, mucus in the mouth or they've got slight wheezing that it's not noticeable, uh, you just increase the temperature and depending on the species you either increase or decrease the humidity levels. Uh, Burmese pythons come from wetlands, uh, certain locality of reticulated python come from wetlands so they enjoy high humidity where you look at other python species, ball pythons, uh, Angolan pythons, they, uh, African rock pythons, uh, Afri South African pythons, they, they, they prefer drier conditions, they come from drier conditions. So species like that will lower the um, humidity levels and then species like Burmese python and reticulated python and whatever else <laughs> comes from, from, from uh, rainforest, tropical, wetland sort of conditions, you would increase the humidity level. Um, you can actually go vice versa, but a lot of people have experienced more progress for uh, Burmese python, for example, uh, if you increase the humidity with the temperature conditions. So after you've increased humidity or, or decreased humidity, uh, what would you do if that still doesn't prove to be successful in treating all right? There's a lot of different methods, uh, but the most advisable method, in my opinion, is you treat them with Batril. Hopefully they're still feeders, and then what you could do is you actually inject the Batril into the feeding item, which is a lot less stress on both yourself and the animal, and then you feed, um, then you feed the animal that prey item that contains the Batril. Um, that normally works. It's... Uh, pretty easy uh, in previous right, put this one away. you can just continue yeah. um, in in the past a lot of people have injected the injected the animal with petrol but animal that animals uh, which well, snakes that uh, in today's market are in a variety of morphs let's say albino for example obviously lack uh, melanin so if you inject them with Batril, it actually leaves a lot of uh, tissue scarring. Even normal uh, animals that don't lack melanin or anything do injure tissue scarring, but it's a lot more noticeable in albinos. Um, and that's something you don't really want. It also puts a lot of strain and stress onto the animal. So you can also, um, injure, uh, you can also uh, administer it orally, where you can take a tube, sub the tube down the animal's stomach. Um, and you can treat it that way if the animal's a non-feeder, but the best way to treat it is to inject it into the prey item and then to feed the animal with it. So, um, so now we know that if you increase the humidity or decrease the humidity and RI still hasn't improved, we can resort to actual medication. Yes. Um, in regards to the medication, the Batril now, what's the dosage? I mean, you can't, you can't probably just take a needle and just inject the X amount into the food. There's, there has to be a formula behind it. And then the other thing is, 
How do you acquire Baytrol? Okay, um, it is obviously if you're inexperienced, um, don't take this uh, this information as you're good enough to do it yourself. Uh, always consult your veterinary Ooh, very first. Very important, yes. guys. They're We'll, we'll cover the rest still, buddy. That's very important what he's saying now. Um, consult your veterinary, your experienced veterinary um, that have dealt with uh, and have high experience in quick, A quick interrupt. Um, who would be a... Uh, so, so sorry for all my um, out-of-the-country viewers, but we're trying to help some of our local guys as well. Who would be a good vet to make use of when you have a sick snake? Uh, I always use Shabir from, from the Eden Bowl vet. Even Velvet Shabir. All right, yes. well, that's nice um, to know as well. I've never had any issues with Shabir whatsoever. Even the other, um, other, what's the word? Um, not uh, veterinaries. Veterinaries, all right. Uh, that also work at the same practice at Shabir. Um, I've had no issues with them whatsoever. They're amazing. They do a good job. I 100% recommend them. All right. So now that we know what medicine to use, what vet to use, what's the dosage, and where can we get the medicine? Uh, dosages work out, uh, you weigh your animal and let's, uh, dosage works out uh, one mole per kilo. So if you've got a one kilogram snake, that's obviously one mole. If you have a five kilogram snake, that's five moles. If you have a 500 gram snake, that's 0.5 moles. 100, uh, did I say 500 gram snake? Yeah, you did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, 100 gram snake, that's 0.1 mole, so forth, whatever. So always ensure that your mix ratio is correct. Rather underdose than overdose, um, it can end up quite lethal because you must also remember that as you treat the animal, you have the potentiality of affecting the good bacteria in the animal system. Now, I know that uh, with a lot of things, adding B12 to your treatment mix. B complex. B, yeah, B complex is actually a good thing. Like, um, for example, you do one mole per one kilogram petrol and then half of that per kilogram for B complex. Yes. So is this um, is this also a very good thing for both colubrids and worms? It's um, most of the case uh, scenario uh, you don't really require for colubrids but for pythons yes it really I mean it, it, it really gives them a kick for energy it helps them fight through the the, the bacterial infection um, it's an annoying flight. <laughs> <laughs> I see it. <laughs> um, it really helps to fight back the bacterial infection. Um, also, rather underdose than overdose, uh, only administer it orally. Uh, I would never ever suggest injecting that. If you've ever injected yourself with B complex, um, you can only imagine what you're putting your animal through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yes, um, but also do not do it yourself. It can cause more dom damage than actually helping the animal if you do it incorrectly. So rather consult somebody that's got a lot more experience with this. All right, and then uh, back to the last one again. Where do we get the medicine? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can get it from your local veterinary. Uh, most veterinaries should have it as it's essentially used for cattle. Um, uh, Baytrol is uh, is an antibiotic that a lot of farmers use for the cattle. You can get it from any veterinary. Um, if you do have a script for it, so normally only farmers, uh, zookeepers, uh, park licensed holders should be able to um, acquire a prescription for it, then you can actually get it from Onestaput Vet, which uh, the crew vet there by Onestaput Vet would be able to supply you with the Baytrol, obviously, if you have a prescription for it. All right, so now we know how to identify, what to identify, what the medicines are, where to get the medicines, and if we don't know how to use it, who to ask. Uh, another thing that I want to ask is, uh, we mentioned a lot of risks in using Baytrol and uh, B12 now, and B-complex, B -co B -complex and actually the treatment of RI. What, 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 are the, what, what would you say are the three main risks if there even are that many, but what are the three main risks of uh, treating for a respiratory infection? Three main risks of treating for respiratory infection, if you're not careful, you can actually make it worse than fixing it. Uh, it could end up uh, fatally affecting animals, so, um, otherwise making an animal worse where uh, treating it is out of the case where um, you'll eventually have to consult the vet, which is the first option, always consult your vet. Um, if you're experienced enough to to treat this animal by yourself, um, ensure that you know what you're doing. You could affect this animal in a very negative way, if not kill the animal, as I mentioned, fatally injuring. Mm. All right, so well, the risks are pretty bad. And then uh, tell me, do the risks differ from adult specimens to, uh, let's say, juveniles or hatchlings? 
uh, does age and size of animals actually play a role in um, the risks for treating for RI? Yes. Um, essentially, your animal has to be, uh, obviously, if it's got respiratory infection, it's not exactly the healthiest. Early signs of respiratory infection, the animal will still have good body bacteria. Your animal requires body bacteria. If it has no body bacteria, it's got no way to treat itself because also the animal needs to treat itself. So you also... Uh, even treating it, sorry, uh, if you do treat it with Batril, if you go the prey item method, you always want to use the smaller prey item than a larger prey item. So whatever size, so let's say you feed your animal a large mouse, rather go for a fuzzy mouse, so it uses less strength to digest that food. So it uses more of its good body bacteria, uh, good bacteria to fight against the infection than it is to break down food items. So obviously with a larger specimen, there would be a larger amount of beneficial bacteria yes, than but with a hatching or a neonate. Yes, but look at Burmese pythons or reticulated pythons. A lot of keepers, uh, won't mention names, will power feed their animals and 90% of their breeding stock are over beast animals. So an over beast animal is also not a healthy animal. That also doesn't promote good bacteria growth or anything else like that. That's also very, very, very risky to treat an animal that's... So uh, general health of the snake plays a big role in the effectiveness of the treatment. Yes. Which can be expected. I mean, if you're an unhealthy person and you have a cold, let's say you're a smoker, um, you smoke a lot of cigarettes and you get a cold, obviously your cold is going to be much worse because, well, your lungs aren't good. So that's, that's exactly what the same thing is with snakes, right? So if you overfeed or if you underfeed, that's also a very bad thing. If you overfeed or underfeed, your snake's obviously not going to have that strong immunity. And when you start treating it, it's stressful for the first thing, right? Snakes stress out very easily, and especially when it comes to being sick and being handled. Because you guys got to remember, you have to physically inspect your snake when it has RI. Not all the time you can actually see bubbling and growing. So a lot of times you have to neck it, open up the mouth, and actually check. So that also puts a lot of stress on the snake. And if it's an unhealthy snake, and it's sick, and it's getting the extra stress, it's usually, it's usually a down root cycle from there on. So actually, guys, the, the most important thing, right, with when it comes to RI is actually treating the snake from the get-go oh, no, I'm, I'm off trail but the, the most important thing is to actually raise your snake healthy RI can be avoided with proper care proper research and proper husbandry yes there are cases where things just go south that is what it is when that happens you at least have a healthy snake for the for the start of it it's the start of its journey it's been healthy so when it gets RI it makes the treatment more effective and obviously it makes it easier to get the snake back to health. All right, so if you have an individual that has RI, right, what can you do to prevent the spread from that respiratory infection? Because RI is very contagious, guys, but how can you prevent the spread of respiratory infection to the rest of your most precious valued collection? I mean, we all, even if it's just a collection of silly stuff like corn snakes and stuff, you know, it's still precious to us. So how do we make sure that it doesn't spread to the rest of our animals? isolate the animal you ensure that as you treat the animal it's got no contact with any other of your species ensure that the equipment you use is completely sterilized and also have no connection with any of your other species until treatment is over so preferably you always want to a lot of experienced keepers have their own separate um, medical utensils that they use for treating animals for if it can be mites, respiratory infection, mouth rot, scale rot, whatever. That is always kept separately from the other equipment that they use for the everyday use of cleaning the animals, the F10, the snake hooks, tweezers, um, whichever they use to treat the animals. Always keep an infected animal isolated. Always ensure that after you're done with the infected animal that you're completely sterilized before you work with any other of your species. As Akkot has mentioned, it is very, very, very contagious. All right, so basically when you have a snake that has all right, good quarantine practice yes. is what's necessary to make sure it doesn't spread. Yes. Now let's say, for example, you're co-housing a snake. Um, uh, it's, not main, it's not always the best to co-house, but there are certain things or certain species that you can actually successfully co-house. So, that's that's the topic for another video. We're not going to debate on this, but if you do have actually individuals that are co-housed, right, and one of those individuals got RI, would you quarantine both individuals?
All right, guys, and again, a massive shout out and a thank you to Julian. This was a really great video. It was really um, helpful. I hope you guys actually learned something from this. Um, thank you very much, guys, for watching this video. If you guys want to continue seeing videos like this, very informative, where we actually go to other people, get more opinions than just the, my own opinions, then we can do that as well, guys. From Ohan Exotics, peace out. Peace.